My parents come from uh, Serramato, which is um, a village um, um, majorly of the Keen subgroup tribes. And um, they uh, moved. My father went to college um, in uh, Khartoum during the colonial time. It was called uh, Gordon College at the time. Now it's called University of Khartoum. And um, except for my elder siblings, all of us were seven, six of us were b born uh, in Khartoum. But as all Nubians are, we have a very tight links with our families, and friends, and the village. Um, we learned uh, Nubians. I mean, I tell you a story about my um, grandmother who came early with my mother and aunt because she didn't have any other children. When they moved to Khartoum, she came to Khartoum. And um, I've known her all her life. She never spoke anything but Nubian. And one of these days we said, um, Grandma, we cannot understand you. So in Nubian, she said, you want me to talk Arabic while you don't talk Nubian? If you want to understand me, you have to talk my language. And this is how we learned the language. This is how we learned the cul culture. And, um, but we had a very strong link with the uh, with, with our family in the village. And even after the resettlement of Nubians, uh, part of our families refused to move with everybody. And they kept on moving with the lake. Once the lake stabilized, they built their last house. And we have a very tight relationship with that part of the family too. So we go to the north and we go to the east too. The displaced Nubians were about 27 villages and northernmost was the village of Faras, which is uh, nearest to the Egyptian borders. Um, Serre Matto, or Serre East, as we call it, uh, is about uh, um, 100 kilometers away from that, um, from that border. And um, there are three major subgroups in, in, in that uh, village. Um, which is the Daudab, the Nuria, and the Dakin. And um, we're very proud to be Dakin. I mean, uh, you know, for a child to grow up and, and they tell you, uh, you are Dakin, whether it be my grandmother, and then my mother, and then my father. I never knew what was the significance of all of this until I grew up and until, of course, unfortunately, the catastrophe of 1964, where all of them have been displaced. displaced. Um, so um, Serra East, unfortunately, now became what we call village number four. Uh, because to, op til, op to, to forget history or to make fee people forget history, um, we dehumanize them and dehumanize what they um, um, love most and cling to most. One of them, uh, their namings, uh, th th their past, uh, where do they come from? Um, I it's not an opposition to the dams uh, as such. We all want electricity and um, more power, and uh, we would like to have uh, more irrigation canals and lands to irrigate. But um, it's a question of who we are. The dam over Nubia is not the first. I mean, I'm talking about Aswan Dam now here, uh, the big, huge, um, uh, colossal building. Uh, it's not the first. It's the uh, fifth um, dam over the Nile. Um, and the first thing that was said to the Nubians uh, by the president at that time, and all of those who uh, believed in a new Sudan after independence. Remember, it was 1964. We had our independence uh, January 1959. So um, the idea of the sacrificial lamp being the Nubian uh, was the slogan. And uh, not only this, unfortunately, many of uh, my father's generations and so on um, were uh, they had to face the fait accompli, if you like, that uh, people are going to be um, to be um, displaced. So th this is this was one. While um, Sudanese people, I mean, the, and I'm quoting here, 
um, an uncle of mine, uh, a wise one, uh, Daoud, who said, well, uh, the Sudanese people will never forget this sacrifice for you. Now, the sad reading after 50 years which we, where we have enough evidence of what this displacement is like, and I'm, uh, and I'm thinking of this um, in terms of the new displacement of the Meroe, Manasir Hamadab people right now, uh, after 50 years when you look at the new land that was acquired by the Nubians or where the Nubians were displaced to is a miserable reading where you have an enormous amount of uh, health problems, you have very bad logistics and again massive migration but this time they look like refugees. Um, there is no one in the um, east where the Nubians have been um, um, uh, resettled, if you like, there is none of them who doesn't have family in or around Khartoum area, that's to say the capital city of Sudan. And why is this? Because there are so many tropical diseases. The uh, chances, the um, opportunities for employment, education and so on, all of the logistics are extremely poor. We did not do enough to develop this region and we have enough um, enough time to um, say well you know what uh, let's have a look and see in this 40 years how did we do um, we look at it and we say it's a failure it's a failed experience we cannot do it again um, millions of wonderful land has been flooded lost to us and above all the archaeological finding that that's uh, in there now um, the rest of Nubia, which is the land of the Mahas and the Sikot, um, uh, and going into Dungulau, these, these, these are subgroups of, of Nubians, or they are Nubians, um, um, or subdivisions of Nubians. Uh, they are, um, th th there was intention of building a dam in 1995. I mean, we are, we are saying intention because up to now we don't know. Um, what is going to happen. It's just like a nightmare or a threat. Every now and then we come up with the idea or, or we hear the president uh, talking about reviving this project, which is Kajabar. And now they want to build another two dams on the bend of the Nile. So that is why um, of late it became, um, it kind of opened the wounds. And um, many of the, um, the, um, the uh, Nubian uh, communities are against the building of these dams. If they build the Kajabar Dam, this would be the last of the wonderful Nubian land. And here we're not talking about 50,000 in the Sudanese border. We are talking about 99 villages along the Nile. We are talking about one and a half million uh, people. We are talking about one million acres of fertile land. We are talking about the last um, prestigious date palms that people live on. Uh, we are talking about archaeologically uh, archaeology that we did not even um, scratch the surface of. So th there are many reasons that uh, Nubian communities are against this this dam, and the way that the government is retaliating. Um, is uh, simply um, um, violates all human rights. Now we have an enormous amount of concern, of, of anger, um, of Nubian communities, and I haven't met one um, who is not concerned about the dams being built on Nubian land. The, dams, dams alone, these big colossal dams, are not a solution. Uh, I would. I would like to have a dialogue, would like to open it up to have much more expertise. From my point of view personally, I would like to have more ex experts on wind and solar energy, and I think we can, we can do that. If we have to go to the rivers and start damming them, not these colossal projects. Small dams with small electrical um, power. The idea is we need electricity. We are not romanticizing uh, Nubia. We do not want it to be a closed kind of can where uh, 
uh, we talk about the culture and we talk about the history of it, the uh, archaeological findings and all of this. No, we would like to open Nubia. It has to come up to the 21st century. There are enormous amount of problems. We need fridges to keep our antidotes, um, our uh, malaria uh, medicines, all of this. But the idea, you cannot do it through dams. And the major thing is most of the electricity generated in Nubia or in Marawi goes to other cities while these people are in the dark. It's not about being sacrificial lamp anymore. It is be becoming part and parcel of this big country that we call Sudan.